join me in prayer as we prepare for our sermon this morning. Most holy God, we give you thanks because you are good, and we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you know what teams that you need to get to win in Tecmo Super Bowl every single time? If you don't know, Tecmo Super Bowl is a game played on the original Nintendo system NES, okay? If you want to score a touchdown on almost every single play, you need to get the Oakland Raiders and run Bo Jackson, okay? Because no one can stop Bo Jackson for some reason in that game. He can just run over any would-be tackler. Or if you would like to also win, perhaps, you can select the, the San Francisco 49ers and have Joe Montana throw a bomb over 100 yards to Jerry Rice, and he will catch it almost every single time. It's like he's shooting through the air if, uh, and, and catches the ball. I loved that game. I still, in a way, as you can tell, sort of love that game. But I remember when the Christmas that we got the Nintendo, I think it was 1989 or something, not the first year, of course. We never got things on the first year, but we got our thing on the second year, and we each got a game, and, and Tecmo Super Bowl uh, was my game, and I loved this gift, and I played this for, for a lot, a lot, and a lot, not only with my brothers, but on, on my own, and even it, it came, I didn't play with it for a while after that, and then when I got back in, in college, and for a few years after college, I played with my friend, uh, uh, Josh Malden, who is also a preacher's kid, and we would actually just have little tournaments. We would create this tournament, and we would see who was best based off what team, who was the best Tecmo Super Bowl, and we still argue about who's actually better. But my NES system and that game are now and have been for a long time in um, behind these doors in the shortest shelving unit that's built into my condo, and I never really open those doors. It's there with the DVD player that I also never use anymore, right? And so these things that once were so valuable to me and gifts that I, I treasured are now behind these doors. And I might break it out like once a year uh, uh, and play it, maybe want to play a game with, with Cade or something. But I swear, I think it's been over a year since I've turned on my Nintendo, which once was a gift that I cherish so, so much. I really don't have that much use for. Sure, I might break it out once a year, every couple years, show it to an old friend, you know, who also grew up playing Nintendo or, 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 or and, and let Kate enjoy uh, an old game. Um, but I really don't use it that much uh, anymore. And sometimes we receive gifts um, and they, they're so meaningful to us. And then when we don't really have use for them, we, we, we sort of put them away. And sometimes we don't receive gifts that well at all. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about receiving well, receiving gifts well. We are in the, the um, fourth week of Advent. The first two weeks we spent on our series, Beloved. Last week we took a break for Coco and Carol. Thank you so much for being here. This room was jam-packed. It was lots of fun. The cocoa was delicious. I got some of the way out. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, and this week we're getting back into the Beloved series again. And remember that we celebrate in this series about the beloved. We celebrate the arrival of the beloved in the Christ child. And we wait on the, the, the beloved's return. All will be made as it should be. But also, we not only recognize that, that Christ is the beloved, but that we have our own belovedness revealed because we know Christ. We are all beloved by God. So we are all God's beloved. Let's keep all this in mind as we read our scripture today, because there are three spots in Mark, the gospel of Mark. We're reading from the gospel of Mark during our Advent season. Rarely done to read from Mark in Advent because there's no birth narrative, but there's beloved is used three times at the baptism, which we talked about the first week, at uh, the time where the transfiguration, where Jesus is, is speaking with Moses and Elijah on, on the mountaintop. And, and then we have it here in this story. And this is a different story. This is a parable. 
and it's not as uplifting as the others, as you might expect. So I apologize for perhaps what might seem this dark kind of story this morning. Uh, but we're going to read from Mark 12, uh, 1 through 11. Won't you read along with me or, or, or follow along as, as I read the scripture this morning? Then he began to speak to them in parables. When he says them, these are a group of people in the temple who are trying to, who are upset with Jesus for seeming to uh, show his authority and usurp their authority. They don't like this very much. And so he begins to speak to them in parables. He says, a man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat and others they killed. He had still one other a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Jesus tells this parable about those who are questioning his authority and would like to keep things exactly the same and are not listening to his message, the good news that he is bringing him. And we can sort of see this parable. You can read parables in lots of different ways. That's one of the beautiful things about parables is that you can sort of read it at different times in your life and see different messages. And there's lots of different meanings. It's not always extremely a clear message all the time. And it's difficult to make a one-to-one comparison about things. Metaphors always break down at some point. But we can sort of see this overarching story, how we can sort of line this up with a story about how God has sent God's messengers to God's creation to tell them about the what they should be doing. Prophets he has sent, and the nation, it seems, has rejected them. It's never good for a prophet because a prophet challenges the status quo. The prophet challenges even those who are in power. And throughout history, prophets have been rejected. Their message often lives on, and we read about it today, but often prophets are rejected and even killed. And so in this parable, the the, the vineyard owner sends his own beloved son because he feels this message is, is so important. And we have this in Jesus. The beloved one is sent. And yet the vineyard workers... The vineyard, those who are the tenants, they reject even the son. And, and, they, and they kill the beloved and throw him outside the city. They did not receive him well. They rejected him. And so we have this story, and, and we can see it as sort of a way like that the, the old system is gone then. Those who are in charge of the old system ha, ha, have not uh, been good stewards and so I'm, it's been opened up to others. And as people who are, are, benefits, are beneficiaries of it being opened up, in a way we give thanks and we say, oh, or at least we are the ones that we receive the gift, right? We're kind of like the potential good guys in this story because those who were over the vineyard, those were the people who were kind of dense, right? But us, we, I mean, why would we be in church this morning if we weren't seeking to follow after, right, the beloved, We received the beloved, so perhaps we are the good. Thank God that we are the ones that we have received him. 
while others have rejected Jesus Christ. Us. We have received the beloved one, and we have received it well, we think. And it's true. At some point, we have received the Christ. We have received the message of the beloved. At least that's my hope for you, is that you have. And perhaps when you received it, you received it well with, with, with open arms and, and you allowed it to sort of transform your, your heart and, and your mind and the way that you lived as you sought to follow after Christ. But you're like me, you know. You're like me. Sometimes you really receive that gift well and sometimes you don't. Sometimes the Nintendo system stays behind the doors because you don't have much use for it anymore. You have other things that you want to you focus on. Other things are helping you accomplish what is truly most in, important to you. Every once in a while, you realize the, the, that you want it and that you receive it again. Sometimes we think that, I think that if we, if we receive Jesus once, and that's all that's necessary. But I think one of the great things about Advent and the Christmas season is that it reminds us that we don't just receive Jesus once. We have to continue to receive Jesus into our hearts and make space for, for Jesus in our lives. We can't just put Jesus behind the cabinet when, when, it's, when it's inconvenient and then pull Jesus back out and show him off to our friends when, when it is. Because you haven't really truly received Christ or the message of Christ. If, it's not, if you're not allowing it to actually infuse your spirit, if you're not living with more love and more grace and more compassion, then maybe at one point you've received it, but you haven't created a space in, in your life to maybe full, more fully make use of the gift. When you read that parable, it makes it seem like, oh, like the, the, the vineyard owner doesn't really care much for, for the tenants. But our God loves us. And that's why God sent his beloved. Because God loved us so much. And we need to continue to receive this gift. One way that you can tell if you, if you receive this gift is how you treat others. Are you allowing the gift to be at work in you? You can tell it's by how you are treating others. If you are able to see the beloved in others, even with that someone that you cannot stand, even that person who you might want to call your enemy, even that person you can't understand how they think or what they do at all, can you see the beloved in them? Can you see Jesus Christ, the spirit, the divine spark that exists in every single being? Can you receive all from the high to the low and everybody in between with the same spirit that we say that we want to receive the Christ child with? And I know that that's a difficult thing to, it's a very idealistic thing maybe to, to do, to, to, to consider. But perhaps when we allow Christ to live in us more fully, we can begin to see with the eyes of Christ in the world who sees all as beloved sees you as beloved, sees me as beloved, 
sees our enemies as beloved. So as we approach this Christmas season, we can get caught up in, in the hubbub of, of, of do we have enough gifts? Do, do we have the right gifts? How will people receive those gifts? But in the midst of all that, don't forget to spend some time in reflection and wonder about whether you have created a space within yourself to receive Christ anew this season to allow God's love and grace and compassion to live in you anew this season so that when you are with family, when you are with friends, when you meet your neighbor, when you meet your enemy, you might be able to receive them well as you would receive Christ and look on them with love and not disdain. Look on them as someone, as an opportunity to be in relationship with and not as someone to reject, someone to include, and not someone to exclude. Because I'll say it again, God sent God's beloved in part to reveal that we all are beloved. Amen. Come now to our, our time of communion where we, we eat bread and we, we drink juice and remember the great gift of the beloved one who, out of love for us, gave his very life, lived his life, and then gave it for us so that we might be able to receive the message. The, the people have rejected the cornerstone, and yet today, we remember that rejection and say, I want to receive you. Communion is a gift, a gift of grace for those who receive it. On the night that he gave himself up, he was sitting around a table with his friends and he gave thanks over the bread. He blessed it and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, I want you to remember me and the life that I lived. He took the cup gave thanks over it and blessed it and said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, I want you to remember me and the life that I lived. And so we do that today. We remember the life and death and resurrection of Christ and we pray that these items might become for us the body and blood of Christ so that we might be for the, the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Amen.